Thank you. Now, first I should say that if I talk in my own funny language of English, and I talk too fast, you know, just put your hand up. And I'll try and remember to slow down. But I'm going to slow down. Is, is this all right at this speed? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. You know, but inevitably, one tends to speed up in your own language. So, what I want to do, you can see I've rearranged the room. We want to make the session, I promise you we'll finish on time, right? Even if we start a little bit late. Um, is to make it a little bit practical as well. Because all good learning, I think, should start with something that catches the children's attention. So you're my children at the minute, as it were. Okay? So let's start off with this thing. And this is where I've got my next word in case I don't do it right. Okay. Now, there's a Russian word, which I can just about read. You can all read it, can't you? Yeah? yeah. And what does it mean? Station. Train station. And how do you say it? Voxel. Voxel? Okay. Why is it called Voxel? Anyone know? Voxel, um, Voxel. Because uh, I remember that in French, this word is va, 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 va. Ga, ga. Ga, ga. Ga. Maybe it's related with that. No, oh, oh ga, yes, ga. Turkish actually uses just G-A-R for station. Yeah. They've adopted the French word oh, yeah. in Turkey. But no, this is very particular. So here's a teacher in the art telling you something new. It actually is a Russian word for railway station, but it comes from a small town just on the edge of the centre of London. Yes, I know. You know Vauxhall, don't you? Yes, I do. Yep. Now, if you were to go to a Waterloo station in London and get on the train going south, the next station will be Vauxhall. <laughs> Why did that become this? And there are two stories to it. No one's quite sure which is true. The best one, I think, is, and it certainly is true, it happened. 1836, if it was, Russian engineers came to London to see this new invention, a railway train. They came along to look at it and to see what it was like. And at the time, it only went a few stages from Waterloo to Vauxhall. When the train got to Vauxhall, the Russian engineers asked their interpreter, you know, where are we? But the engineer thought and said, what is this? So he said, it's a Vauxhall. <laughs> so they thought, instead of being the name of a place, the word Vauxhall meant railway station. So the Russian engineers thought, ah, so if we go back to Russia, we call Vauxhall, that's the British called a railway station. So they went back to do that. That's one interpretation. The second is that there are lots of uh, pleasure gardens at the time outside of Moscow. People would go and visit them on horse and so on. And they thought when they build the trains, they would name the place where they go to the pleasure gardens after what they saw in London. Because Vauxhall had the other pleasure garden if you went out of the train. That's why I first read it. So, here's a Russian word that actually comes from somewhere in England. And someone's been there, haven't you? I have you never heard about it. You've heard about it. Okay, now the next one. Just a question. Yeah. I know. You know, keep quiet, keep quiet. You know all the answers. There's always one child like this, isn't there? There's always one child. There's no child. No, no, no. Okay. So, so I, I need a volunteer for this one. I need a volunteer. Who's a volunteer? Got to do something. It's not dangerous. It's all right. Anyone want to volunteer? Otherwise, I'll pick someone. <laughs> come on now, I saw what you come. Come on, up you come. Do you want me to? Yeah, I need you. Okay. Yeah. You've got to be a volunteer. Okay. Now, I should show you the answer to why we drive on the left. But the second part of it is for you to think about. Because again, you want to leave children thinking. You know, what's this all about? They get their curiosity raised. Now, I sort of like going back in time maybe a couple of hundred years. So here there are no cars, any way you could travel was on foot or on a horse, on a wagon or by a horse. So you're going slowly. And along the road coming towards me is Isil, okay. who I can see she's a friend, a neighbour, so I see her and I'm gonna greet her as we pass each other. So along we come. Hi Isil, how are you? <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, which side did she pass? Look again. Oh, the right. Which 
Where am I going? On which side of the road? Look at it again. Which side of the road am I on? Okay. Now, if I saw is on horseback and a potential danger. I've not seen her before. She could be a highway woman <laughs> and she might have got a knife or a gun. And which hand do most people use? Right. Right. So if I see her coming towards me on the horse, 50 clock, 50 clock. With a sword. I want to check. I want to check. She hasn't, I might have time to shake hands with her because we're passing on horseback, but I want to check she hasn't got something. So I'm just waiting. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and which side do we pass? Look again. Which side of the road am I on? Left or right? Come look over here. We'll work it out myself. Let's show people this way. You go over there. Go over there. Now let's do it again. Here we pass. Which side of the road am I on? Is left. Yeah. So that sort of just was the way it happened, and people just continue to do that. So when cars came along, there were cars and horses. So people thought, well, you can't sort of just drive in the middle and crash into the horse. So they just continued to drive on the left-hand side. That's one reason. There is another version that says London Bridge was very crowded with houses and shops on it. It was very narrow, so they had to work out a way of passing. But more than that, it's to do with the whole country and just the way we got used to it. Thank you very much. Let's get back to the an unwilling volunteer. No, no, you're very well. That's okay. Thank you. So, so that's sort of answered this part, isn't it? In the UK, you drive on the left. Well, and why do you drive on the right? We? Yeah, you drive on the other side of the road. Uh, no. In your country. Over the road. Over the Most countries have this road. Over the road. You both on the left. hand side. Yeah, most countries drive on your side. Of the yes, road, yes, right. Yeah. Yes. The ones that don't are all the old British countries. Britain, Australia, yeah, yeah, yeah. Australia, New Zealand. So uh, that's Sweden also. Yes, Sweden as well. And Japan. Japan also. So there's a lot of countries we weren't involved in, Sweden and Japan particularly, that drive on the left. So why is it? Now that's given you the answer for why we drive on the left. But why do you drive on the right? Why does anyone drive on the right is another question. So I want to leave you with that because, you see, I don't know the answer, but you can perhaps find out. Okay? So I've got mine. So what I'd like to do in a lesson is give something at the end of the lesson that just captures imagination, starts it off. Now we're going on with what we should do. I'm going to use professional advice now to get this next one. It's just what makes a good school the other one. Yep, that's it. Fantastic. On the slideshow. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased about having a technician here. You know what's fed up with me? Getting everything wrong. So, I want to look this afternoon at what makes a good school. If I was going to go on from this, I would say the next thing ought to be what makes a good classroom. Okay, so that's the next thing. But what we're looking at is the overall thing of what makes a good school. Now, your ideas in this are really, really important. You can see I've set up the room differently, because in a few minutes I want to split you up into groups of two or three to do an activity, because you know, you're not too tired to do it, are you? Ten minutes, not too difficult. Okay, so let's just start off. I want to start with the principles first. The principles that I think could make up a good school, just to talk through. Then I'd like you to see some things that you think would. And I'm going to give you a sheet just to show you it's not too frightening with 10 ideas, okay? And I'll show you what to do with that later. That's a little advert. And um, then we're going to try and look in the last part at just on the practice. What do we mean? How do we bring that into being a good school? So let's just start off with a few of the things. First of all, I think it's very easy to get a school wrong, especially a new school. You're a brand new school, two months we've only been open. Uh, it would have been very easy to get it wrong. I think we've got it right. I think it's going really in the right direction. But it's easy to get things wrong like this. Now, now I, I sat, in, sat in a maths lesson this morning. But I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do it. It was far too difficult for me. It was advanced algebra. These were the 10-year-olds doing it. I felt terrified. 
Um, I think, but it's easy to get things wrong. So how can we try and get things a bit better than that? So what does a good school look like? These are just some ideas that I put down thinking myself of if I were designing this school in Panky. Some of you here know about free school in Panky that I did try and set up in 2007. And you begin to think, what do they look like? But I'm trying to think particularly of this school. Um, so you might think this is a strange one to begin with. I put they start before opening by profiling the type of student they want to develop and build a vision around. They may seem an odd place to start, but some schools have a vision which is very particular. I mentioned to some people that near me in England is a school called Yehudi Menuhin School. He was a famous violinist, and the school is only for pupils who are going to be world-class violinists. They choose people who are really, really good at playing the violin, and choose just one in a thousand of them come to the school. It's only 30 pupils in the school. So it's a pretty easy profile for them. They know what sort of pupils they want, exactly how to choose them and to build their school. Now, I suggest you probably thought before opening the school, you want children who are fairly bright, yeah? You want children who can respond to the challenge of advanced algebra and, and German. You might be joining the other German lesson this morning. Quite scary again, and two scary experiences. Um, they're good though, thank you for doing that, because that was really made me feel part of it, it's good. Um, and also the breathing too, that was good too. <laughs> um, so the sort of type of student you want, so you know how you're going to build your school. It can be as simple as how old are they when they start? How old will they be? If they're going to do British curriculum, do they need to speak English? All these sorts of things you're thinking of the type of people. Then next I think you select a core curriculum that's suited to their vision. So I guess probably you want people to speak my funny language quite well. Um, for good or real my little islanders in the end, probably because of America, <laughs> given the language which most people want to learn. Now, interesting, my daughter's school in England will of course to speak English. The most popular language they all learn is Mandarin. Mandarin. Chinese. Chinese. Yes. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, but they, would you please interrupt, won't you? This is maybe a lecture. Yeah. I attended my lesson. I asked my like, students if they didn't understand you. Um, and they told me yes. Maybe because of your, like, I want to say, gestures, you know, help them to right. understand you easily. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, understand you better than me. But don't worry, we'll come. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so. Um, you have a core curriculum, and here it happens to be British curriculum, but it's really important not just to say how do we follow that. Equally, because British curriculum is very strange in that it's set down, but how to teach it is up to teachers. There's no textbooks, nothing at all. Um, I remember as a head teacher once in England having a presentation by a leading manager from Procter and Gamble from America. He started by saying, in Procter & Gamble, every manager is an individual manager. They think things through for themselves. So we said, well, how do they do that? He said, by following the manual. <laughs> you follow the rule book, that's how you become individual. So Americans are slightly different, because in fact in their schools they do have set textbooks they have to follow. But in Britain they have any set textbooks, so you can use the ones you feel you want to deliver the curriculum. But very, very important. You know, suited to your vision, it is, but then audit it, you know, sort of adjust it, add to it, enhance it. And that's what you're beginning to do here. Beginning to think, how can we change or add to that curriculum to make it fit pupils here? That's really, really important. You're not in England, your pupils are citizens of Azerbaijan. What suits them is different than those in London. Um, so changing it a bit, a whisper of the game. And then, they make explicit to students and the parents what they're trying to achieve and how everyone can contribute. That's, I think, is really important that pupils know what they're here to do. It's made clear to them and to the parents. They don't come along here and complain to ISIL that the colour of the tea berry isn't a very nice one. <laughs> it's made clear that you're committing yourself to a package deal. That's what they get. They don't like it, because they're right. There's a different package. 
come here, that's what you get. Um, what they're trying to achieve, and, and how everyone can contribute. You know, I mean, do any of the parents speak in English to them at home? Maybe, you know, younger ones, if you have them in school, you go shopping one day and buy things in English. You can call it portico, nar, iber, tomatoes, one day, and then call it, you know, peppers, tomatoes, and pomegranates, another day. And just use the language. Um, so everyone knows what you're doing. And now, no one, the school exhibits confidence. And you know you all do. It's like going in your class, and you all look confident. You don't look scared, worried, anxious. You look as though you know what you're delivering, and that's really important. And um, actually, the other lovely thing is, when I'm going in class, and you're smiling at the children, you're not glaring at them saying, be quiet. <laughs> you're actually enjoying being with the children, because they might come teaching otherwise. And um, you trust that the school will help them to be successful. They build trust. Um, and then understand pastoral support and guidance is, is crucial. Some children could come in one morning with a really bad experience, couldn't they? You know, mum's been in hospital, or their pet dog's died, or something. And that pastoral care is as important as the academic care. It's seeing the child as a whole. That's really important if you're looking after a class in the morning when they first come in, when one boy or girl looks a bit unhappy chance to talk. Um, and then you have psychologists in as early schools. We dare call them that thing, you know, we being caught and we call them like a welfare officer, something like that. I'll keep going. Okay. A few more. Um, the school's well organised. So the same standards happen every year. It's thought through your curriculum, your teaching, the timetable. I saw sort of struggling with the timetable. They, we're probably not going to be happy with it, hide quickly. But it's the sort of thing that is well organised and structured. Um, so that the same thing can be offered and you feel comfortable. I know it's first year, so the same thing will be all quite easier. The timetable, at least. Um, the school is purposeful, but relaxed with staff and pupils at ease with each other. That doesn't mean to say you're friends, you know, like buddies with them, even though they're 16, 17, but you're at ease with them. Now, when I'm watching the classrooms, I've seen people are, but they're not sort of memorized like an enemy that's coming into the lesson. You're feeling together, sharing something common purpose. And I spoke to four of the um, year six girls just on Friday. I just said, you know, do you like it here? They said, oh, it's so different from our old school. All four of them said that. And I said, can you summarise it? One of them said, she actually said this to me. She said, I'm only going to use three words. I'm happy here. And isn't that lovely? That of all the things you want the children to be, it's feeling they belong here and they're relaxed. But it is purposeful. You know, I've seen teachers use all sorts of techniques. I've seen them look at someone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it works. <laughs> it does. <It> scared me. <laughs> They've made the point. You have to shout. Made the point. I want to do. Um, the school places a high level of trust in the staff and the students. You know, I saw the board trust you. You're not in the classrooms to watch you. But they believe that what you're here to do, you believe in, and you can deliver it. And that's really important that you feel part of it and can be believed in. And then uh, accountability for staff is internal, not just external. By that I mean, it wouldn't be terrible if you've got a class who are not really that good at English, not very, very good, and they're doing IGCSE in a subject like history, and their scores are not good. And then I saw the board came back and said, well, it's your fault, you're not a good teacher. You know, whatever. That would be terrible. So the judgment should be internal. Just like, I suppose I've been doing, seeing people today, just talking, showing, sharing with people about how they're getting on. This is all making some sense. You're right, yeah. Okay. And then I think everyone feels an emotional attachment to the school. You know what I mean? We don't usually feel emotional attachment 
to the supermarket we go to. You might like him. <laughs> you use it a lot. You might not even to a doctor you go to see. You might do, you might not. And but the school, you're here a long time, aren't you? You know, and those children could be with you. If you get a primary school, you could have them with you for 11 years. That same family, same child. Um, so staff feel it. Everyone should feel they belong here. That's really, really important. Sense of belonging. And in those sort of things, we try to think of staff. Yes, but you try and get the feeling you belonged. And I think a school that's never complacent, but always seeking to refine. Every one of you here will have good ideas of how you can make things better in the school. Do share them. Yeah. Share them with a friend at first. Share them. Do you think that's a good idea? Shall I go and tell our school to know about that? What should I do? Trying to improve all the time. You all have good ideas. And this is ever so important. The sound of laughter is never far away. Um, I must tell you, when I started teaching, I had a classroom with a wooden partition between my room and the other room, so it didn't keep any sound out. And I had children all over the place doing all sorts of activities, and whizzing around doing things, painting that corner of science, a bit of maths here, and they were all chatting. The next door over here was what I thought was an old lady then, an older teacher, and she had all her desks in rows. Once a day, there was a lovely sound of laughter came through the screen. I went to see her and apologised for my class were noisy. You know, I don't know about that. I said, your class is so quiet. They said, can I just share two things with you? She said, I never felt I was succeeding as a teacher until I could control the class with my eyes. And secondly, that we had laughter, all of us, at least once a day. I thought that was a lovely sort of thought. Um, and although she talked differently than I did, she talked very effectively. It was good. Right, now, I want to focus on the success. I want to come to more practical things here. I won't go through that because we're going to have just sort of 10 or 12 minutes for you to do a bit of work. Do you mind doing that? It's quite easy. What I've got here is I've got these 10 ideas of how we can put it max into practice. What I'd like to do is find a partner or three of you, it doesn't matter, you can divide yourselves up, you can move desks if you want to, it's entirely up to you. This is a you know, working space. Try and find what you think for your group are the three most important. Okay? Three most important. If you can, the very most important, and then be prepared to justify it. Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. To explain it. Yeah. Are you alright with my English so far? Is it clear? Can you understand the answer? I love you English. Sorry? I love you English. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, what I'm going to try to do is have a look through it, choose what you think is really most important, the very most important, but if you think there's something that's been missed off here, which is really important, add it on as well. Quite different. Because everyone will have their own idea, but it'll be fascinating to see if anyone agrees. Now, it's not a right or wrong, there is no right or wrong answer. So if the first group say one thing, you don't have to sit there scribbling out, making sure you say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because everyone's view is important, isn't it? I mean, and that's also true in the class, isn't it? There's not one child who says something, it could be right or wrong. I mean, if you ask the question, what's the country you'd most like to visit? Is there a right answer to that? Not really, is it? You know, if I asked you, you'd probably have Loads of different questions, answers to that question. So this is the same. Who wants to go first? Oh, we a volunteer. That's <laughs> great, isn't it? Wonderful. Go on, then. tell us how we're getting on. Uh, you have know, oh, here ten more statements, and I think, as you mentioned, all of them are important to some extent. I did not say that one is uh, more important because I think so. Yes, I think this one is important, but maybe someone has different uh, <laughs> justification do. or. Uh, uh, logic behind it, and I would say I find the eighth statement more important. This is my priority that schools feel school to learning and teaching. Because, uh, at schools, uh, there are a lot of stakeholders like mm -hmm. the parents are stakeholders, the management 
the stakeholder, teachers also are stakeholders. So I think both uh, the students, parents, they must be happy, and at the same time also teachers must be happy to mm -hmm. teach in the school. Mm -hmm. I mean, like for this, we have. I would be, or uh, I must be honest that I have worked for another school before, but here I found different atmosphere. Like uh, I, I had it in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes, and here I'm very happy to work because uh, we have good management. First of all, it's yes, I said really, you know, yes. it's over. I just want to say it's over and we need new regime, like, you know, modern. Yeah. And we are happy to work under pressure, of course. Time can be pressure. But if we feel another pressure, then we cannot uh, show our full, 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 full I would say, uh, capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think uh, this is very important that uh, all stakeholders must be happy, like students must be happy, teachers must be happy to uh, be here. I, I find the eighth statement more important. Thank you very much. Your group share. Good. I think we all give a clap for that. Go second. Or does anyone want to go second? Anyone want to say this? No, that's the roof of the back here. Do you want to or not? I'm not going to ask you. Oh, I'm sorry, you've got more. You're on two, okay? Tell us what you're going to do. Tell us what the other two were. Tell us what the other two were. Well, they can have more What were your other two? Oh, it's a seven and nice. Most of the seven is for the curious and four. Yeah. With um, students with curiosity to learn or improve their knowledge, mm -hmm. and the not just students, also teachers. Mm -hmm. I think school is done its job, and also to do some joy and and also entertainment within the lesson. I think they can feel they can be amplified their four, reducing their four. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to say a third? Nice. Yeah, mine is this nice. very vocal, aren't they? There's always a vocal group in class, and some of them are quite high. It doesn't matter. <laughs> mine is nine. I thought that these problems was working constantly to improve. It's very important. It's just more important than all of them. the most important point for me, because if you hide the problems, or if you feel yourself more important than another one, and if you feel yourself a bit shy to share and ask for help, it, it doesn't lead to success or it doesn't lead to any improvement. If I know uh, if I know there's something and I have a friend who knows my peer who knows this, the pro the, this, the solution of this problem, I feel myself shy or I feel myself a bit uh, not so open-minded to come and to ask, can you show me this because I'm, I, I struggle here. Yes. It's, it doesn't prove neither to me, none to school, it doesn't prove me. It doesn't lead to improvement to any improvement, it's better to come, to come, it's better if it comes and shares it with me, mm -hmm. because it's plus to me, plus to school, yeah. and plus to children who are done to it. That's why to be open-minded, and if you have a problem, to come and ask for advice, okay. advice or for help, or whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Spirit. So, 
Great, that's great, isn't it? Now they're not the same, are they? So you begin to see different views. But themes are coming through, isn't it? Of developing, of sharing, community. Who wants to go? Who wants to go? Yeah, we've got volunteers. Go on go on, yeah, go on, yeah, go on. As our team for a long time, we bring all the ring one and that's why we just uh statement six, teach thought, not yes. So we would like to teach our students uh, different approaches to that method, not only to learn how to the books, but right. find out solutions, different ways in order to solve the problems. Okay. We will have to pause it in the life in a life. So this way they can survive and we will also uh, will Expand their creativity. Okay. Uh, the second place we will have is all of uh, other things that feels good to learn, in, to learn in and teach in because it's also important for teachers to be in a good uh, mm -hmm. like, good environment. <laughs> 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 like, teacher have to serve students in order to teach them as yeah. well. And in the last place, I have these problems for us working as a group, of course. It's Thank you. Important. But I want to add to this if it was teach not only taught but also concept. Yeah. <laughs> what, what we'll do, we'll get arguments started between you <laughs> as well. And I think what we'll do because of time, I believe there's bit something that you could follow up by looking at what you've all put and thinking if you really had to compile a top three from this list, what would it be? Or five, just to think what makes the school special. So what I want to do is just to see how you can focus on the success, where we would go from here. So it's just a little diagram, but first of all, I think a school needs strong leadership. Now, it isn't one person, it's whoever is heading up the school. So it's where the principal and the board help to create a vision. Now, the word there that's very important is help. They don't create vision. I saw hasn't come in with a briefcase and inside it said, the school will be. Okay? It's helping to develop. So, the board are not here to tell you what to do, they're here to facilitate what to do, because the next bit's also important. That the vision they have is shared to the school community and it becomes your own. Now, the word in English, become, doesn't just mean you have to put up with it, but it happens, it develops. You know, like I'm sure in, in science, it develops. <laughs> okay. um, so, this vision is one that's developing. You've only been open two months. You know, you can't really develop a whole feeling in that time, can you? It takes a long time for a hairdresser to develop a vision. You know, to think, can I trust them? Do I want to go back there? What are they offering? What's special about it? Do they offer the tea? Is the music? Is there the other things? And that's just a functional thing. Developing a vision for the school means with each of these children we've got here, What's my vision for them? And corporately, what is it? So that's the first thing. I think, secondly, high quality teaching. I've seen some wonderful teaching this week. Last week, it's been really wonderful to see and to share with what you're doing. Um, and when we did interviews as well, we saw people who really wanted to, to just come and be with children. It was lovely. Um, and. I think it needs people who understand how students learn. Not people who understand what it says in the textbook, but actually understanding how people learn. They all learn in different ways. I mean, some people learn better by looking at this. Some people learn better by listening. Some people do better by doing. Let me give you an example. If you were learning a cooking recipe, if I read it to you, well, would that be good? Yeah. Not really, would it? And yet, sometimes that's what we do with knowledge. We read it to them and have to do it. So, if I demonstrated the cooking thing to you, you all sat there and I did it here, that would be better, wouldn't it? But would you actually remember it? Yes, yes. Well, yes. what would be the best way of learning how to cook that particular recipe? If you're making plov, Yes, do it yourself, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, the things you do yourself make it the most effective way of learning. So, how students learn are pretty vibrant, enthusiastic, and inventive. Some years ago, when I say, I went to the Russian drama theatre to see King Lear. Okay? 
And even then, you must children on the third time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Don't believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Only four as you go. <laughs> so, um, I want to see King Lear, because obviously I couldn't understand Russian. I knew the play off by heart nearly enough you know, to know what's happening. Anyway, the guy who was playing King Lear was lovely. He actually got sort of changed and came out and chatted to people afterwards. It was really nice. His English was brilliant. So I had to talk to him and said, you know, King Lear is really difficult to play. Do you, do you know King Lear? Yes. Uh, Shakespeare. Yes. Uh, it's a long one. It's over three hours long. And King Lear is on stage for two hours and speaks for about an hour and 40 minutes. So it's a lot. I said, you must be exhausted being an actor. And he said, what do you do? I said, I was teaching. And he said, so you're a real actor. I'm only a part-time actor. I only have to act each day for one and a half hours or so. You have to do it for five hours every day. Because when we go into classroom, you actually become an actor or an actress, don't you? You're not necessarily yourself. You have to be different a bit with the children. So I think that's important. So knowing teaching is not a soft option. Now, sitting quietly in an office with a computer, you know, a cup of coffee when you want it, Go out for lunch and go quietly home. It's okay. It's not, is it? It's not a soft option. You don't even think I have a quiet life. Uh, but also, high quality going beyond the expected. That doesn't mean to say you're all going to be here till 10 o'clock at night. But there are things that you can do and get asked to do in teaching to go beyond the expected. It could be as simple as a child to say, Can I talk to you after school? They can have a chat, someone you feel you need to talk to, or a bazaar you're going to help to go to and help with, or some sort of play, or talent show, things like that. Um, but that's the joy of teaching, isn't it? Nothing's the same. I, I used to work in the bank, HSBC Bank, and I enjoyed it at first, but then eventually I was not on the counter serving you know, customers, but working at a desk behind. I thought, well, I'm doing stocks and shares, people's wills, deeds of houses. I've been doing this for 40 years, sitting at this desk, not moving. That's boring, isn't it? But see, you, you enter teaching because it is not boring. Um, and also updating professional knowledge. That is really important to keep understanding how you can improve. Really, really important. Um, as this school develops, I'm hoping that I have chances to do more courses and short Arsenal chat about it. So, that's the next one. Another one. How do we use assessment data effectively? I've put this picture up because of a true thing that happened to me. I've also done school inspections in England and abroad as an inspector coming in. I went to one school in England, went into the classroom of nine-year-olds. They were doing a project on the Romans and the teacher kept asking them questions. And one of them were all shooting their hands up, answering the questions. And they were a really enthusiastic class. And I went afterwards to talk to the teacher just briefly, so that went really well. And she burst into tears, started crying. <laughs> I calmed her down, got one of the other lady teachers to come help her. I said, well, what's that? She you found me out, didn't you? I said, now what do you mean? She said, well, I was really frightened that children didn't know the answers. So I told them, if they knew the answer, put their right hand up. They didn't know the answer, but they left hand <laughs> <laughs> Then you see, I said to her, I said to her, do you know, that's one of the best things I've ever done. I said, what do you do? You shouldn't tell it to me. But you said, I said, actually, that's a really good thing to do. Because I, you know exactly how many people know the answers. And who doesn't? <laughs> you know, you've actually done some assessment on children straight away. And so you know, it can work really well. But you know, data's easily gathered. You can do lots of tests with children. Test them forever. But what do you do with it? What happens with that information? How is it actually changing what you do in the classroom? If you know that 10 out of 15 know that algebra. <laughs> I was like, oh, but in 10 or 15, what do you do about five who don't? 
What do you do about the 10 that are really good at it? Or the five are excellent at it? What do we use the data for? Then, um, does testing on entry lead to target? So, if children are tested when they first come in, how is that information used? Does it mean that this child's coming in with not very good English? So what does that mean? Well, their maths may not be quite standard, or maybe really advanced. What, what do we do with that information? Then, does the data drive improvement or gather dust? <laughs> you can test, oh, I can't think. There's all the test results. They've done their science exam. <laughs> in the results. But does it just go in the drawer? Or a file, or is it actually actively used? So it's really in the sort of posh language. Uh, sorry about the English on this one. Up. I know it's a sort of phrase rather different words, formative as well as summative. In other words, summative. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'll explain it because I know it's a, it's a technical word. Formative means you're doing assessment as you go along to form a view of a child to form what sort of information material you use, as well as summative is a, like an end of year exam, yeah. how long they, how they got on at the end of the year. But if all we do is an end of year exam, how do we prepare them, what do we know about them as the year goes on? So the question really is, how do you assess children and how do you use that knowledge? Hard, isn't it? Tricky on that. Um, then, I think offering a broad, balanced curriculum, and we talked a little bit about this, it's not just subjects, the curriculum, really, is it? It's also, what do you want the child to become? You know, what is an educated person? Is it just subjects? Or is it building a culture within the school? Do you want children to be friendly with each other? I think they really are. And I honestly think you can be proud of yourselves because they are. Um, but it's not just teaching maths or history or French, whatever it may be. It's more than that, being in a school. And creating rites of passage. No, sorry, that's another technical thing. I think it means how do you sort of pass through the school. And I know we were talking about that, weren't we? Americans, we always think, have a very naive view of life. I don't, don't think really correctly because you graduate from everything from nursery school, kindergarten. Um, what's the last I saw? What's the opposite of graduate? Of a graduate? What's the opposite? Um, undergraduate. Yeah. When when you when are you an undergraduate? Am I? No, no. When, when is anyone? Not you. No, when is anyone? Before you get your bachelor degree, yes, yes. that's why you're an undergraduate. So you can only become a graduate when you've got your first degree. Yes. So you can't graduate before that. You can leave when you become a graduate. However, that's an arguable point because I know in this country you can graduate. But in building rites of passage, how do children get welcomed into the school? Maybe they have a buddy who looks after them for the first week or two. What are the rites of passage through the school, beginning of the school year? How do you create that feeling of beginning? How do you finish the school year? What do you make of it to make something special of this particular institution? Make it your own. Um, then make them just ordinary events, isn't it? Halloween, Christmas bazaar, yeah, talent show. All those things become part of what you do. Book okay, yeah, all sorts. You'll, you'll have lots of them. More than you want. <laughs> They'll keep coming. And then some you'll keep, some you won't, some you think you could. And then involving the community and sharing with them. That's important too, isn't it? Um, I'm sure we'll build links with British Council, probably the British Embassy, and there are lots of others as well, other embassies, but all the community itself. I mean, could you take something from this school to other people and share with them? Right, and above all, this is why I think, a place that's filled with joy and fulfilment. I'd love to think a school is somewhere people come to joyfully. Shakespeare didn't go willingly to school. He described it, one of his plays, as creeping unwillingly as a snail to school. And you can still see in Stratford-on-Avon 
the desk that Shakespeare sat at where he was learning until he went to Oxford. Um, he obviously understood what it was like to creep into school to learn Latin and ancient Greek and all the other things. You know, I like to think you hear children, I see them all, you come in here, they're quite smiling, aren't they? They're not unhappy to be here. And it's a place of joy and fulfillment, and it should be for you as well. It shouldn't be just for children. It's a place where you feel happy to be, and you feel it's fulfilling your own career. So, I've run out of time now, but I've got to tell one more story to finish the story. Uh, I'm going to tell one more story and I can get, I need a picture of another PowerPoint. It's only one picture. See if we can find it, a third one. Does that work?
but uh, you know what I mean. Have, have a good Christmas, we call it. So have a great holiday as well. Thank you. And best wishes to all of you.